All right, uh, I'm Jose Montero, as you know. Uh, I have given a lecture twice on medical tourism before, and I have given it to medical students um, in an internationally, in international medicine scholarly concentration. And I wanted to give it to this group because this group hasn't heard before, and we've talked so much about medicine, the science of medicine, the clinical aspects of medicine. I want to talk about, a little bit more about the, the global aspects of medicine, somewhat the competition that we might have overseas. Uh, uh, for our business, um, and this is just a different aspect that we probably see differently than we did maybe 10 years ago, and definitely more than 15 years ago when uh, the term medical tourism was thought in a different fashion when people would come overseas. My first experience was it when I was in residency at Duke. We had this whole floor just pretty much put aside because some prince of Saudi Arabia was coming to get a cat. Um, and let, they, you know, the guy is taking, got himself taken care of. I'm sure the hospital got significant payment as a result of that. And I was saying, wow, this is crazy. They come all the way over here for care. And yes, that's how medical tourism, let's say 10, 20 years ago was, was looked upon because the United States was the mecca of great care. Um, and, and people who had wealth would seek to go over here uh, because they perceived it as as the highest standard of care at the time. And now we're seeing a different thing. We're seeing people going elsewhere for a variety of reasons, which we'll go over in, in this lecture. And I want this to be a bit interactive, so we'll, we'll try to see, you stop me along the way if you want. So what is medical tourism? You can define it so many different ways. Um, but basically it's going to a different country to obtain medical care and it's sometimes or sometimes not combined with a tourism package. Um, uh, it doesn't have to be, and many times it isn't. But in certain situations, uh, a package is, is brought together by a concierge service that's, that's built in and providing this type of care. <clears throat> so you combine cost-effective medical treatments with potentially leisure, fun, and a little bit of vacation time. Um, over the last several years, and over the last decade, it has grown to be a, a multi-billion dollar industry, and that billion dollar can become trillion dollar in, in, in no time at all. Um, what people will look at as far as the, the, the countries that are doing this is it could potentially look, uh, help subsidize other medical care and other aspects of their country. And those are kind of topics that we'll discuss um, during this lecture. Medical tourism isn't anything new. I mean, in Asia, um, there was mineral and hot springs in the Bronze Age. And water seemed to have this magical healing touch in certain special areas of the world. And people would travel far and wide to get to go there. The Greeks, they had their mythology, and, and uh, the Greek god of escape, I can't even say it, Asclepia, actually was a, the god of health. So they actually had a, a, uh, a, uh, spa uh, or a center in Epidarius where actually people travel throughout the Mediterranean to this Greek area to get care. The Romans subsequently took over again in the Mediterranean it, um, supported medical tourism through more of you know the uh, hot water baths. But there's there's examples elsewhere. India and the yoga retreats, the Buddhist, the Buddhist pilgrimages, meditation centers elsewhere. There's various areas throughout the world, throughout time, people went to get either alternative care or some kind of care or healing powers as they, as they saw fit. Many times, near water sources so they can travel to it, but also involving water many times. Spa towns um, occurred in Europe in the 17th and 18th century. And again, at that time, there's a renaissance of, of the Roman baths occurring at the same time. We, even in the U.S., we had this thing called you know, health farms. Um, whether it be health farms for for weight gain, health farms for for uh, drug use now, it's become a very popular thing with celebrities, but health farms with certain, certain things. So the river Ganges for the Hindus used, again, water is symbolic. And also, I think means of transportation to some extent. Many times, uh, I think people travel through to get to water, but also symbolic as well. Of, of healing powers. So, but 
let's go to modern med medical tourism. What draws people? And people who do this do it for different reasons, but there seem to be two or three main themes that come across. Um, there's issues with our healthcare systems in the Western world. The three major issues is cost, uh, what, even for those who are insured. If you get medical insurance and you want to have cosmetic surgery, that's not covered. You have medical insurance and you find out that certain coverages are lacking, for example, transplantation, that may not be covered depending on what plan you have. So these costly treatments, even if you are insured, are not affordable. And you're definitely not affordable if you're uninsured because th those, th those barriers are even bigger. Some countries have these national, great national health services to provide all this care, but the waiting time for quote unquote elective surgeries can be quite dramatic. We've all heard of having cardio, uh, coronary artery bypass surgery, it takes quite a long time. I don't know about you, but if I know I have a you know 80% left main, and I'm stable, have stable angina, I don't know if I want to wait around to have my bypass surgery. And that's the same thing that happens with many other people. They see the opportunity of going to, for example, Delhi, India, where there's a center there that does 14,000 cases a year, more than any cases I know of any institution or city. I can only imagine in India when I go down, everybody has a stern army scar. But that's true. They're, they probably have more expertise because they do more of them there than any other place in the world. Um, and, you know, those who have insurance have incomplete coverage sometimes, as we, as we discussed earlier. And what's changed? We're really, probably the last decade, what's changed is the perception. Hey, the technology that, we, that the U.S. has, it's probably originated in many of these countries. India, for example, is a biotechnology country. Southeast Asia, a lot of technology in those Southeast Asian countries. Well, What's also happening, we have all these human resources, these people getting trained uh, in the U.S., but maybe migrating back to their home country, and therefore you're having a human resources that's being built up as well. I look at this room right here, and we have people from a lot of places that are different. It's, some of you will go back, some of you will not go back to your home country. And you guys know of people that do go back, and that adds to that resource that, that's being developed there. Um, so that's, that, that's helped quite a bit. The ease and the affordability is probably changing in the last couple of years, but it probably will be still remain affordable to travel. I mean, I did not know this until I read some, some of the articles that I read, but they have a special M visa for, in India for the medical tourism. It's special, as designated as the M visa, I did, I, just for that specific reason alone. Now, most people do not get that M visa when they go to India, they go under a, a a, a, uh, tourist, a, a tourism visa and still get their medical tourism that way but there is actually a designation code just for that reason alone in India. So it, it's happening quite a bit. Um, and most people find out, hey, I can get my medical care and I can spring for a vacation for me and someone else to go with me probably less than I could get it done in the U.S. alone and staying home. So the numbers, how many people are seeking care abroad. No one really knows the answer. So all the numbers you, that you come up with are rough estimates. There's really no one keeping tabs of it. Even that M visa code in India, people realize that they're using other codes to get in. So no one can really keep track of how many. But they, they, some people expect about 150,000 just for surgical procedures alone overseas. And a lot of people think that's a very low estimate. Some people think it's significantly higher. And I suspect it may be up to five times higher. I don't know. Uh, a Time Magazine poll polled people in the U.S. If you could, if you traveled, if you had to travel 10,000 miles to save $5,000 in your medical bill, would you do it? In more than half, 61% said they would. That's not that much. Think about it. $5,000. You know what? The, that's five hospital days right there if you're uninsured. So it is not that much, it is not that high of a threshold for many Americans to think about leaving overseas, even though you would think the U.S., one of the great areas where you could get great medical care. We got competition, guys. We got competition. The other thing that's scary is J JCO, Joint Commission. It used to be called JCO. Now it's Joint Commission. 
they have an international branch they developed. And I think they just developed it less than 10 years ago. I think it's between five and seven years ago. I don't know exactly. But now they have over 170 overseas hospital accredited in over 31 countries. So they're accrediting them close to the same standards as the U.S. Some people argue that they can't be the same standards. They're, they're slightly different. But they're achieving the accreditation. If they achieve accreditation and the American people say, well, this is joint commission. This is the same commission that, that accredits the U.S. hospitals. Then, you know, it can't be that bad. And I know there's people out there saying, you know, there's certain hospitals in my own town that I wouldn't go to. Um, and, and, I've seen, and I've heard people going to these countries having great experiences, having very clean rooms, very, being treated very well, having good experiences. That word of mouth is getting pretty far to some extent. So, some of these hospitals, how they get developed, there's different manners of doing it. So, you know, most of these end up having a think tank and saying, wait a minute, we could probably, we have a good resource in this certain area. We have good technology. We have a good um, human resources. Maybe we can garner support for, for medical tourism. Some governments have actually got into that and say, we'll incentivize this and have some kind of joint government private sector partnership so we can bring in people for medical tourism. Because they realize, probably for every dollar of, medical, of cost to come in, you probably have about five dollars or five times that much in expenditures that maybe uh, the country may see. Sort of like the Super Bowl. When Tampa gets to the Super Bowl, it's all this revenue that comes in because of people coming in. Not because they're buying tickets to get into the Super Bowl. It's because they're going to the restaurants, they're going to the movie theater, they're going who knows where and who knows why. And I don't want to know. <laughs> cheap, cheap. <laughs> all right. And it's lower than the cost of the U.S. Why is, it, why is it lower? We all know this answer, but I might as well just spell it out. The insurance bureaucracy. Third-party payers. Well, they're great because you get paid. But, you know, the fact that you have to go through a third party means there's all those people you have to hire, all that human resources, all that red tape, all that time. And all those insurance, people in the insurance industry they have to be paid for. So that's all that extra money that's there. When you go over there, cash. That's how you probably cash or check. Probably most cash. <laughs> so there is no third party payer. It's you paying that party to some extent. We'll talk about the insurance industry in a bit. The other thing is either there's no tort law or very little. Um, um, actually, there, there, there's. No such thing as very high malpractice rates over there yet. Uh, so what's really happening there is you have people who probably have, if they have malpractice insurance, probably paying one-fifth or maybe one-tenth of what we pay here. And therefore, don't have to worry about the high outputs. And that's part of the expenses that we have in some of our medical uh, situations. There's no entitlement uh, mentality over there. So people feel they have to have the best of everything here. I mean, we see it sometimes, I see it many times when I know there's fetal care occurring, and yet we are obligated to provide all care until we, until the patients or their families say it's enough is enough. That is not necessarily the mentality that is in the rest of the world. Um, provide care many times until the point where they feel it's quote unquote reasonable. Um, healthcare wages, much lower. I mean, physicians elsewhere. You guys, again, you can tell me. How much does a physician get paid in India versus a physician paid here? A, fi uh, a third of what we get? It's much less. Much less. A fourth, a fifth? Probably 25%. I'll say. Let's just. Make anywhere, uh, in every, in medicine, we make All right. So, so that's a third. I'll say about a third. In India, to some extent. Um, yet, for that cost of living in India, that's a pretty good living in India. Because the cost of living is significantly low as well. Is there such a thing as a nursing shortage out in the, third, in, in, in the rest of the world? The answer is probably no. The nursing shortage is here in the U.S., but there's really no nursing shortage in Southeast Asia. In fact, there are probably nurses out of jobs there. Actually, it's probably physicians that have jobs, too. Uh, I know in Europe there's a relative glut in certain countries of physicians. So, again, the demand, you know.
yes, you, you bring up a good point. So nursing care elsewhere is a, a bit different. You know, the family involvement is more substantial elsewhere than it is here in the United States. So therefore, nursing care provided it's a bit different as well. But I agree. My understanding, though, is that the ratio of nursing care may, may be actually better in some of these other hospitals. So the model is closer to the U.S., but yet they have less cost, human resource costs. If you look at what costs most people, most money, most businesses, it's the payment of human resources. Um, adverse effects. You know, this is one area where I have problems. We have so much infection rate. Well, I'll be honest with you. I do infection control at two different hospitals, and infection rates are sometimes not an exact science, even for bloodstream infections, surgical side infections. And if people were coming in to get a procedure done and leaving a week or two later, you may not be able to catch those infections that are late presenting, that may present three weeks, four weeks, a month later. But the reported rates are actually self-reported rates, which, which, which can be issued, but they tend to be comparable or better than what we see in the U.S. reported. And that transparency is important. The U.S. health consumer doesn't really distinguish how accurate that number is. They just see that number. So you notice that in our country, we're actually looking for transparency of information. We're looking for how much information as far as infection rates and people were surfing the web. Certain states have already gone there. A lot of states have not. These countries have done that and have provided that information in whatever fashion they have provided it. And therefore, are, are advertising in some respects their services because of that, because of that transparency. These hospitals, comfort is at a premium. Level of service at a premium. Because they want, word of mouth is gold to them. It really is gold, actually better than gold to them. Gold prices come down. <laughs> now. Yeah. That's what's happening. Medical tourism has changed places. Has changed places quite a bit. I imagine, it really has. And this is their motto. First class services and probably royalty class services. Probably the better mind. Royalty class services at third world prices. And that really is their motto because they realize we got bargain prices for, for human resources. We got the technology there. We got the human resources there. And we can lure people out just on cost alone, let alone if you're in Canada and England on the time, on the waiting time period alone. They realize that. And I, I've talked a lot about Asia and Middle East, but same thing, of course, with South America and Central America. Go to Costa Rica. Same scenario. One of our transplant patients. Well, that's what I'm saying. I saw him for a heart transplant. I'm like, yes. uh, sorry to tell you, but obviously it didn't work if I'm seeing you working well for a Yeah, I, I, I actually spoke to him. I spoke to our heart transplant candidate who had the stem cells. Or, hey, despite the fact that it didn't work for him, he still raves about the experience. About the experience. 
the fact that he still needed a heart transplant. That, that, gentleman, that secondary, he raved about the experience altogether. And he would do it again if needed to be. If he knew, for another type of procedure. He obviously needed the heart. But he raved about it. I, I remember this guy. I know. Agreed. Agreed. I agreed. And that's some of the some of the um, issues that may occur with uh, medical tourism. How big of a deal is it? These are some numbers that I come up with. It probably at minimum accounts for about two to three thousand three billion dollars per year, US dollars from American tourism medical tourism. They think by by twenty twelve at least twenty to twenty five billion per year. If not more, there was one person that said 40 billion. I think that's a bit aggressive, but I don't see it out of the realm of possibility. Well, so how much do we spend on our own healthcare system? We spend about 2.2 trillion per year now. So you know, if you take 20, 25, and 2.2, it's a, it could end up. It could end up as not more. That's a, a, not a blip. One percent is not a blip when you think about a 2.2 trillion dollar industry. So you know, if you look at it, it isn't. That insignificant. What I'm trying to tell you guys, you guys have competition if you guys are staying here. Actually, all medical professions here because we this is competition. Don't think that the U.S. automakers didn't realize, that ignored it, and Japanese made their cars. Look what they, look what happened. This same kind of concept could occur here. So I think that, that should ponder a thought into our medical system about what needs to be tweaked, fixed, or reanalyzed. Um, the actual cost, instead of the two, two to three million or 20, 25, maybe seven to eight times more because of the cost that comes along with it. And then I believe that while 150,000 may have gotten care, I think that's something, this, um, Deloitte survey, um, and output said that 750,000 trial for care, not all may have had procedures. So what kind of cost savings are we talking about? I have different numbers, and you have different numbers depending on who you talk to. The next few slides, I have a few scenarios. Heart valve replacement. Would you go overseas for heart valve replacement? Well, if you have aortic stenosis and live in, 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 in England or Canada, you will probably be on a waiting list. And if you say, you know, I don't want to be put on the waiting list, and I want to go, and I, and I don't want to spend, well, let's put Canadians at a cheaper $100,000 or $160,000. I mean, I go to India where they do so many heart surgeries and get it done for nine to ten thousand dollars and get to see the Taj Mahal. <laughs> Angioplasty, you know, fifty fifty thousand plus. You can go for the same ten thousand in India or Malaysia. A bypass surgery we talked about, they get great savings in bypass surgeries. Again, if I had a left main, I had a weight, I don't know. I don't know. Knee replacements, less of a bargain, but still a bargain. I mean if you spend ten thousand on the procedure, a thousand or two thousand on the trip, another thousand on the hotel, you still make it. You bring someone else with you, and you still make it under the forty thousand dollars. <coughs> Hope this didn't come out right. Um, but this is another site on a website I saw. Bypass surgery. I don't know how they come up with it. It's a much lower cost, but still significantly less. Dude, transplant surgeries? Yes. Bone marrow transplant surgery. You can get it done, you know, here, the total cost. I'm not sure how Moffitt costs for bone marrow transplant surgery. Probably a little bit higher than 250000 Because, you know, they're, that's if nothing goes wrong. Ten times less in India. Now, you may have an issue of I'm actually doing, having such a strong procedure and follow-up care there. But, but I, I bet the, I'm willing to say that they probably have comparable rates of, of success there. Liver transplantation, you have more balls in my opinion. You know, over 250,000, 300,000, 10% less in India. And the hip replacements, significantly cheaper as well. They also provide specialized treatment. Remember, royalty care at third, uh, third world prices. So, do you guys give your cell phones out to, to, to your patients? They tend to. Hey, if I want to get a huge in income, and I know I want to see this patient for you know, three visits, I'm going, to, I'm going to make sure that they remember Dr. So-and-so so they can send their friends to Dr. So-and-so. So they may offer their personal cell phone numbers. They may have a whole hour consultation where they spend just talking, you and them, 
no third year medical student. <laughs> um, and we discuss all the issues and you, you know, play it up, hammer it up pretty good. They need to provide concierge services and we've already talked about four star, okay, you can five star meals and hotels, and guest rooms. Um, and, you know, they have companies that are springing up. There's at least three that I know of that actually package these in concierge style. So they'll, they'll find you the right country for the right procedure. See what kind of package you want. And yes, you need to bring a friend along to help you out in the transportation, going up and back. And they'll set it all up for you. So, you know, that $100,000 procedure, it costs maybe 10000 You had another tw another 10000 20000 So you have a whole package deal taken care of. Of course, I'm sure they all get their cut, but that's that's being done. And there's some unique procedures that we that you were approaching that was done elsewhere. Some that are less, and some that are more controversial. They have this hip re joint resurfacing, which they mention a lot in India. They do this instead of total hip replacement. So somehow they resurface the ball joint, and without doing that major surgery, they were able to do it much cheaper and actually with reasonable results. It sounds like. I don't think it's FDA approved here, so we don't do it here. Stem cell therapy, which we're right now not doing because of political reasons to some extent. And um, and not much researching it. I'm being down there with probably less than ideal data, albeit. But yet, a patient who's desperate, who sees this on the internet as something that's being withheld from the U.S. public, they're more likely to go out there and look. And we have the biggest tool. The internet that probably helps out medical tours and more than anything else out there right now. And there's all their alternative therapies. You can go yoga, you can do anything alternative as well. Again, we would not perceive that happening too much here. Probably does happen to some extent here, but not publicized. But it really is marketed elsewhere. Uh, the new push. Like I said, we were a hotspot. We used to be the hotspot pre-internet. Pre-9-11, we were the hotspot. We were the mecca of, of, of what was thought to be the highest of medical care. We had the human resources. We had the technology. And we had the reputation. Now we had the reputation of having the most expensive health care system. And one of the best. But most, one of the most expensive as well as a result of that. If not the most expensive. 9-11 changed a few things. We, we prioritized things and then people had a hard time coming in. Well, hell with that, they said. If I can't go there, I'll go to Malaysia. I'll go to Thailand. I'll go to India. I'll go to Dubai. It's closer to home. They have their doctors over here now, board certified, and do it there. And better food. Oh, well, more kosher food. Whatever. <laughs> more, more culturally competent food. Whatever you want to call it. <laughs> I don't know what the right way of saying that is. So as a result, and actually, as a result, these countries and many others had a conscious effort. This doesn't happen overnight without a conscious effort. Had a conscious effort of doing this. And in fact, in India, I believe in 2002, they actually had a program. They actually went to the government. They actually consciously tried to promote medical tourism. I think it happened in 2002, only six years ago. And they're the latecomer. And they're the latecomer. India's the latecomer and all this. Yeah, because I remember when I was growing up, there were already people from Saudi Arabia who were talking about going to India for their open But I'll be, believe it or not, India's a relative latecomer. Thailand got an earlier jump. Malaysia got an earlier jump. We got people in Central America got, got an earlier jump than, than, than they did. So they got new facilities, they did our technology, they thought about it. They said, hey, yeah, we'll just get residency training for all our guys, get them board certified. They'll come back because the U.S., you know, they want to keep their own. But they want to, you know, with cheap labor and they want to train doctors. That's a good will. But we, uh, we want them to come back. We want them to come back. And actually, they actively recruited some of the people to come to them. They not, may not be the Patels, the, 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 the typical last name. They might be a Montero, for all I know, <laughs> and Mumbai, who, who, who's doing something. That'd be scary. <laughs> it's a Portuguese name, I think, more than anything else. So I might be doing the stem cell stuff. <laughs> okay, so what is it? What's in it for the country? The country is doing it. Obviously, there's a lot of interest in there. Money, increased domestic, uh, gross domestic product. They can upgrade their services. So you know, they gotta keep ahead. Now there's competition between countries. 
So what do they want to do? They want to be the best. What do you think Dubai is trying to do? They got oil money. They're investing in, in an infrastructure, but they're also investing to bring in tourist dollars. Medical tourism is one of those tourist dollars. They want to be the Mecca. And they have the Harvard name now there as well. And John Hopkins is somewhere else. I forget where it's at. Um, uh, Duke has other places, and, the, these brand, and then Mayo has all these places. All, all these brand names attached with it upgrades their services. They generate foreign exchange. All of a sudden, they become uh, uh, create a favorable uh, balance of power. They boost their own tourism because, like, like I said, you spend so much money on, on the medical stuff, you can spend money elsewhere. And if you go over there and you have a good experience, you're more likely to have a favorable idea of that country. If you have a favorable idea of that country, you want to talk to your friends, and they're going to make a trip, whether it be for medical tourism or for regular tourism. It's then the brain drain. What's the brain drain? All right. Where's the brain drain right now? No, not right here. Probably, actually, if you ask me, it's in Africa right now with the AIDS epidemic. A lot of, and then because of the cost of living there, that's an example of brain drain. Because right now, in Africa, it's hard to find enough human resources. Heck, you're looking for nurses to provide medical care rather than doctors providing medical care. Same applies to these countries. They want, don't you want to keep the best and brightest patient, people in your own place? Many times in the past, the breast and breast went to England, went to Western Europe, went to the U.S. So, and, they, and that happened for generations. Well, now, they're able to attract them. Yes, at a lower pain rate, but relative to the cost of living in that country, they're still doing great. They're still doing great because of the relative cost of living in that country. So, right, the facilities are nice, and the probably the respect you earn in that country. Here many times you have you have the insecurities of, of, of malpractice litigation. You probably have that to some, that, those countries to some extent, but maybe not to the same degree yet that you have here. And I say yet, because I think all that may change with time. And then buying international goodwill. What, you know, I'm providing a service. I'm providing health care. How can that not come across correctly? All right. So, numbers are growing all over the globe as far as countries supporting medical tourism. There's no actual number. They occur pretty much in every continent. I don't know if Australia does it. I know Antarctica doesn't. But that's about the only two, potentially. Um, and maybe Australia probably does to some extent. Um, even South Africa does it. Um, South America does it. Costa Rica, no, does plenty of it. Uh, so, every continent except for probably Antarctica. Um, they bring money to the local economy and health care upgrades um, the local facilities. Then you have the issues where, where the money goes. And, you know, why do I bring this up? It doesn't matter to the person paying the money. You know, we just want to get the health care. But really, it is a question that needs to be really answered because if you look at global economies, it becomes an issue. You can have in certain countries, actually, you can have in certain cities, a medical center of excellence with the, neg with the sea of neglect. And we'll talk about in the next slide or two about Bumregard and, and, and Bangkok, Thailand where they have this huge, mech, that's probably the pinnacle of medical tourism as far as facility. And yet you have the, the university hospital in the same town, relatively poor, with not the same facilities. And therefore the people, the general Joe P. Public, Joe the Plumber of <laughs> Thailand <laughs> or India, Pepe Super, <laughs> Super Metal, I like that. We not have the same, we not have the same type of, of care given to, obviously, Forget the, the cush, the care, is what I'm talking about. Um, not only that, if you're a physician working in this, in this city, where are you more likely to want to practice at? The medical tourist hotspot, where you have these great surgeons, surgeries happening all the time, and, and more influx of, of money, or to this public hospital, which you, you humanistically want to serve, but realistically are getting underpaid there. And there's people who actually moonlight. They work at these university hospitals. They moonlight on the weekend. So that during the five days they work, they make less than those two days on the weekend. And significantly less. You know, it doesn't even compare. So there's issues there. Um, money attained is not necessarily reinvested in local needs. And again, who are we to say what they're being reinvested in? But yet, you go, you go to these countries, and many of these countries have... The structure, the uh, the uh, 
the what's it called the status there quite differently the um, the class system where you had the very rich and the very poor I forget the term and yet who are you you serving you're probably serving the upper class more at the at the at the neglect potentially the lower class yet the whole country wins what needs to happen if you think about it from a uh, idealistic standpoint is you will hope the government sees that and reinvest it for both. But you gotta keep ahead of your competitor. So there's always that issue. Is I gotta be better than my competitor so I can bring, bring in more. So you have to be state of the art. Um, so you worry about removing medical resources away from local citizens and widening the two-tiered health system that really exists. And you guys have been, if you guys have been to these hospitals, you gotta understand there just really is a two-tiered health system that, that can occur. And to some extent, you'll see it sometimes in some, if you have gone to a, a Grady Memorial or, 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 or um, charity before it closed, um, the issues that occur versus maybe the private hospital down the street that can occur, like say uh, uh, Emory Hospital, same kind of scenario that can occur. You went there. Is that, is that correct? Uh, the difference between... Uh, it's, it is, it is, uh, much so, so who are we to say that when... It, there actually exists some, to some extent, that here in the United States. There really does exist that. The example I want to talk about, probably the pinnacle of medical tourism globally right now. Mount Regard Hospital in Thailand, 554 bed facility, a little less size in Tampa General, with a staff of over 2,600. 50,000 Americans per year receive care there per them. Um, actually, it's per this guy, Ramirez de Arellano. Um, over 200 surgeons there are U.S. trained and board certified. I'm golden. If you say that, I say, well, heck, that's the same type of surgeons that I get here in the United States. Foreign patients make up about half their clientele. And down the street, they have the university hospital, or the government hospital, we'll call it. I'm not saying it's a university hospital, maybe a government hospital. They emphasize treatment or prevention as, as people do not usually travel for routine care. The only ex exception to that is that quote unquote executive physical that sometimes can occur. But aside from that executive physical, you're not going to follow up with these guys for your blood pressure or for your blood sugars. Or, so there's an issue with that. If, if, if you look at it, it's, it's sort of like the U.S. in extreme because I think we have too much subspecialized care and we really need to have a focus on preventative care, which sorely is missed in many of these areas. And you provide th Thailand's, probably Bangkok's, own internal brain drain versus public sector. The brain drain is actually within the whole, the own, their own city because it's drawing all the best and brightest to where the money's at. Like I said, Indian medical tourism is probably late, like, relatively late coming to this industry, but they have a lot of people, a lot of resources, and biotechnology really exists there. Uh, they also have pharmaceuticals that meet the FDA requirements, so they use that as a positive. And they're, they're cheap. It's also amazing. E, they can get U.S.-made medications cheaper than we can. I mean, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta understand that the U.S. health consumer pays for all the research and development for the pharmaceutical industry. The rest of the world gets it pretty much at generic price, but the U.S. healthcare consumer pays for research and development. So we end up paying the retail price generally, whereas you know the other people they get it at a more bargain basement price, and I think that's bit crazy. That's the way it exists currently. Uh, we do get flash drives, yes. <laughs> um, they think they can get 2.2 billion or more per year in dollars by the year 2010, 2012. Excuse me. So they actually see this as a, as a significant boom. They have plenty of good good docs there. They have plenty of good resources there. And again, you had the internal brain drain. I think that can occur there in certain certain areas, but they see this as economically very attractive to them. Why not? They can provide services that are uncommon elsewhere. Again, a, a common example would be that hip resurfacing rather than replacement. Again, if you've gone to India though, and you see some of the public hospitals there, there's a significant lack of certain basic healthcare issues that that it can occur. And I guess it can, most of these countries have those issues. Most of those countries have this issue. How about transplant tourism? It's not as brisk as the other stuff, but it does occur. I mean, we've all heard people getting 
situations where we've seen on TV shows that people get in trouble for trying to jump the list or getting early on the list, and there has been issues with whatever organ getting, getting jumping people on the list. Forget that list, Smish. I go overseas and get my organ. Now, again, the risk and benefits there are different. You don't know how you're going to get your organ, who's coming from, and how well it is screened for infectious diseases or for viability. But the outcomes thus far seem to be very good. Black market and other. I see the black market in the transplant. I have a harder time seeing it in the other because what's what's the black market component of it? It's really providing a service that you're willing to pay. Uh, you're not you're not giving up a, a kidney or or uh, part of a liver for that. But there really is there really is potential black market. There's also plenty of, plenty of ethical issues uh, with this. Um, the other ethical issue is. If you have Blue Cross Blue Shield or Aetna or United, I don't want to pick on any insurance company, and say you don't have a transplant, you know, it will still cost you out of pocket, let's say $80,000 to get whatever, X organ. But if you agree to go overseas and get it in done in India, for, it will get it down to 25000 Is that coercive or not? So the insurance is one year. This is, going to be, this, is, this is what the next issue with medical tourism is going to be. It's happening now, and it's going to happen more and more, because this is what's happening now. If I'm an insurance company, forget any organ, any procedure. I'm Aetna. I got to pay, oh, Thingy needs to have a hip. I don't know what the heck happened to her, but she needs to have a hip. It's all that snowboarding. It's all that snowboarding. Snow, snow what? Okay, forget it. But she needs to have a hip. And I don't know how much I have, but we'll just make it twenty thousand dollars. I don't know what it, what it costs. I forgot what the number was. Let's say twenty five thousand dollars. You have to pay twenty five thousand dollars. But if you want to go maybe to Costa Rica, I'm not sure if they do hips there. But if you want to go to South America somewhere and do it for ten thousand, we'll fly you there, get you back, pay ten thousand. You have to pay ten thousand instead of twenty five thousand. Is that coercive? Will insurance companies do that? The answer is yes. Not only will insurance companies do that, but you. The employer of a business who wants to keep health care costs down probably want the insurance company to promote that so that your premiums will go down. That's, that's coercive, but that's business. That's already happening. I imagine it is. Not to that, maybe not that obvious to everybody, but it's, I'm sure it's happening. So, whether well, is it coercive, or is it, or is it a business decision? They're giving you a quote-unquote choice. That's not that's the, the lawyers will get there eventually. The lawyers are not sure what to do here because. It, you know, what you can do overseas, what's the litigation overseas for what's the litigation here? The reality is, I think that will, you'll see cases probably in the next five years of who's going to be targeted. Is it going to be the insurance company who's doing this? The concierge services? Or can they touch overseas stuff? Probably cannot touch overseas stuff. So there's a lot of area here of nebulous area that needs to be worked out. Follow-up care needs to be worked out as well. All right. And actually, that's the other thing. 10,000 10, in Costa Rica, but if you want to go higher, 25,000 in India, you will have to pay the difference. I'm sure. They're, they're always going to have a margin. They'll probably give you a choice, but somewhat of a choice. And they'll give you websites. I, you put, type in medical tourism websites, I don't know where to start, but it's everywhere. Transportation guidelines and ethics. You know, people will talk about the ethics, informed consent. I think you form consent from all parties, whether if you're donating a kidney, if you're receiving a kidney, and, and what about the express payments, the black market potential that exists as well? Then the, the, the issue is, the transportation may not be the worst part, and usually it's not, oh my gosh, shock's here. It may not be, it may, it may not be the hardest part. 
may not be the hardest part. I mean, we all know. Transportation part usually is the one that's tough that goes easy. That's the post-op care, the medication management, the complications that exist. They go there. They come back in, let's say, in two or three weeks, maybe a month. Then follow-up care is here. And that's the hard part that, that sometimes gets ne ne neglected or actually gets pushed on to the provider here in the United States. So that's an issue that can, that can occur. So what, they, what some places are doing is actually giving a package so you can actually get care. And I'm sure what's happening, or what's being, if it's not happening, it's probably being thought of, is finding a cadre of doctors that will be willing to take care of post-care with this for a fee. That's a business. It's a business decision. Probably occurs. And most of them probably don't have to do much for it. But I'm sure that's being done as well. Oops. There actually is an MTA. Probably started about one or two years ago. Medical Tourism Association. Actually, where's the station? West Palm Beach, I believe. <laughs> Florida, of all places. Um, it's a, it, yeah, West Palm, always a problem place. <laughs> International hospitals, clinics, medical tourism companies. Those are the companies that set up everything. Insurers, employers, education institutions, etc. All of these have a, a potential gain and are sort of members. You can go to their website. Um, they have a website as well. This is like the AMA, except it's the MTA. It, it's an organization that promotes, it basically uses an organization with a mission to promote growth in medical tourism. They probably, the, probably, the, probably these international hospitals and clinics. Absolutely. Absolutely they are. So the international health hospitals and clinics probably put money into this. So are they affiliated anyhow with our government here? They're affiliated and lobbying with our government. <laughs> That's how their affiliation is, and lobbying. They set credentialing standards. They set credentialing standards. That's kind of ethically and kind of perversely an uh, issue when they set their own credentialing standards. But they're basically saying they got the... JCI, Joint Commission International, and they got another one, and it's a different acronym. I don't know what it stands for. For hospitals and medical tourism companies, they're trying to increase awareness. Basically, they want to market and, util and have increased utilization. So they want to protect the stakeholders, which are those above there, typically. You guys, throughout this lecture, have brought up the issues. You know, what are the concerns about it? It's a relatively unregulated industry. I mean, we all have this credit crisis, and we talk about not regulated credit crisis, but this is also not regulated. We're relatively unregulated elsewhere. Well, how regulated is JCI? Are they looking at outcomes? So they're they're simply looking at saying, yes, that's, 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 you know, you've got a tag on your defibrillator. Okay, that's good. Or are they actually looking at the outcomes? Are they looking at the outcomes of the The honest, Fred, I actually don't know exactly. And actually, some of them say that they, they, they're slightly more lenient than the Joint Commission here, but the others argue that they're astringent and maybe more. So there's varying degrees. I, I honestly don't know. But if I tell them, here's my, exactly, exactly. You sat the Joint Commission numerous of times, even these current Joint Commissions. The reality is that doesn't tell you the story of the hospital or the type of care they provide sometimes. It gives you a snapshot picture of what is reported sometimes. Right. I'm sure they have prep time, like we used to have prep time for JC for Joint Commission. They do have prep time, they do have prep time, and it's somewhat the regulations are similar, and the conditions are similar to what it is there in the U.S., and that's how it's set up, basically. And that's how the hospitals advertise. Yeah. And, uh, the other thing is about the local infection, the rate, even in public hospitals, not even, not even in JCI, credit hospitals, even in public hospitals, the less. Actually, do they go? Do they do post-discharge surveillance? For example, if they go, Joe Blum goes, Joe the plumber again, Pepe the plumber, whatever, plum, <laughs> if, he go, if he goes and gets a hip replacement and it have an infection three months later, does that count as an infection? See, we might have a slightly different definitions. That is the power Because I think we, we are being pushed to do that, and we do do that. And I think being very vigilant with the definition and having less ability to do that in these hospitals because of the natural issue of medical tourism, not because of any other, not because of neglect. 
He, exactly. They don't have that access to. Exactly. They don't. So they don't have that access. It's not any fault. I'm not putting any fault in it, but it's just the real inability to really have that uh, post-charge discharge surveillance is an issue. So the answer is I don't know, but I've heard that's pretty close. Pretty close to the same what Joint Commission does here. I I can't say any more than that because that's all I've read and. There actually is a whole article on JCI that I wasn't going to go through. I went through the annual report, just said 170 different, over 170 different locations, different hospitals in over 31 countries. Uh, and they've only been at it for six, five or six years. Um, there actually is, they do medical tourism in non JCI accredited hospitals. Yeah, you can get it for cheaper if you want. They're just not accredited. Um, again, a little bit more at your risk. You as a health consumer may not see that as, a, as attractive, except for when you see 30% discount. That's a sale. They might go after it. They might go after it. I always say quality and safety do come at a cost. We have regulation upon regulation upon regulation upon regulation. There's a reason for that. Because something happened to Joe Plummer one time. And as a result, we had to do this regulation. Something happened to Sally the Singer, and we had to do this regulation. And over each regulation comes at a, with a financial cost. It does come with a financial cost. Whether there be more human resources, whether there be more time doing something, whether it be looking at checking this box, which takes a cost. And over time, it does. And I have a feeling that overseas, that cost will slowly increase because of increased regulation, and eventually the cost of living will probably get closer, I think, over time. The AMA, actually, I have more slides on the AMA, but even two years ago, we're looking for disclosure of risk to clients, HIPAA compliant. Exchange records, CPT codes for post up care. You know what the AMA is always about their own selves. So they want to make sure that they get paid for post up care. That's so the one thing I'm going to have against the AMA. They're almost to a fault to self serving. Again, that's sort of any association like that probably is. Prevention of insurers offering incentives for overseas care. So we've talked about the risk. Basically, you surf in the internet. That's your that's your knowledge of, of this location and maybe word of mouth in certain numbers that you see on the screen. And then if you go to these companies that are out there, they give you a favorable report or a less favorable report. So you're actually looking at circuit circuit markers of information. There's very limited liability amount of practice protection. Um, that doesn't seem to be scaring off a lot of people, especially when they see the outcomes that are, seem to be very good. But we've all seen at least one case. Uh, something overseas, and not sometimes multiple cases, something done overseas that's had a bad outcome and they re regret it. And I guess we've seen it many a times from the internally having a bad outcome and they regret it as well, so can't neglect it. Then there's post op care issues. I mean, don't forget, if you have a DVT risk and you go on a plane back, there's a higher increase of DVTs as well, even with that air travel additionally to it. And also the post op care that you would normally need for a procedure, for example, transportation. Uh, and then the actual risk of air travel, which is really negligible compared to everything else. So AMA, this exercise, they came out with guidelines. These, they were adopted in their meeting in June of 2008. So that shows you two things. The AMA, is, it's on their radar screen. And they see it as, they do see it as an issue. Um, that medical tourism must be voluntary. Try not to coerce them. Financial incentives should not limit or restrict options, whether to be diagnostic options or therapeutic options. Should only be referred to accredited facilities. I say that to say that. There's facilities, I guess, in the U.S. that aren't, aren't accredited, but I guess. Uh, local follow-up care should be coordinated and arranged, finance arranged prior to trans travel. So if you're going to go overseas, get transplantation, you better have follow-up care financed and set up here in the U.S. first, if you because that's where you're going to be living to get your follow-up care. That's a big issue uh, uh, that people have. Uh, I imagine there's people slip out of there and go back in here and show up. People get a transplantation in New York and come to Florida. Hey, I'm here. I got a heart transplant. Can you take care of me? What are you going to say? No. Especially if I'm we're a heart transplant center. Yeah, you could, but I tell you that publicity, bad publicity, it could go to Channel 8 News and... I'm serious. I mean, reality is, you could. You probably won't. You probably suggest they get the care, but if they if, if they won't, then you, you do the humanitarian issue. Yeah, I mean, we have, like, a guy who was on the last month. He was just in New York. He couldn't get, Ha, ha, ha.
<laughs> it's snowbirds, it's true. So, any other guidelines I suggest? Is coverage for travel outside the U.S. must include follow-up care as well. So, if you're going to cover, if the insurance company is going to cover the cost there, they should also cover the post-op coverage cost as well. <laughs> that probably costs extra. <laughs> Patients should be informed of their rights and legal response or lack of legal response prior to going abroad. So they should be notified of the potential to sue or not sue if something should go wrong. Access to physician licensing outcome data, facility credit should be should be available. That, just tell them who they're who's taking care of them. And they, they, you know, they make sure that everything is HIPAA compliant. HIPAA is such a, a barrier here. They want, they want to make sure they, they don't, they don't succumb to that barrier over there. But to be honest with you, people go overseas probably more for privacy than for other reasons. Gender reassignment surgery. I think it's some place in Thailand specializes in that. Who the heck's gonna figure it out in the U.S. when they come back? I'm a girl now. Instead of having it in a hospital, they're here. They're gonna figure it out much easier than in Thailand. Just change your name from Francis Frank to Francis. You know, same stuff like that. The same, you know, that's what happens. Cosmetic surgery. Aside from the cost, it's also going away for a vacation and then also look younger. It's done for for those reasons as well. Patients should, patients should be given information on surgical procedures, long flights, or vac uh, or or vacation activity, all the risks that, that, that occur throughout those activities. The future and barriers that can occur, um, they're going to go after insurance companies. I mean, it makes sense because of what we said. If, if the insurance company, Aetna, whatever, United, is going to pay so X amount of dollars for a procedure and they get X minus $2,000 going overseas, then the employer paying the insurance company is going to want, the, want that money to go less. So they want their premium to go down. The insurance company wants to try to try to get less per procedure, so it makes sense that they may go after the insurance company, third-party payers. So I see this as growing, not diminishing, and then there probably is going to be an issue as far as the coerciveness of this practice. But really, if you look at it from two different ends, it's a it's a choice that's given. Uh, and these AMA guidelines, if I were uh, one of these companies, I'd be saying, "Why well, do this? I think it's voluntary." I'm not restricted. I'm giving them choices. So if I were them, I'd be going right through each of these lists here, each bullet point, and, and arguing that you comply to this. And most do. And most really do. Um, it, it, I expect eventually more accreditation and more regulation over, over time. That's going to be slower. But it's going to happen. You have one bad outcome here. Just like it happened in the U.S. One bad outcome here costs, causes you to do this. Well, when I come here, it causes you to do this. That's, that's why we do so many steps to get a, a simple procedure taken care of. And I'm sure that these steps may or may not apply in other places, or they may have trimmed down the steps to make it to, to, to streamline the process because it, they, seem, they appear to be extraneous in certain situations. Um, the other bullet point is, you know, it's questions to ponder. How do we make sure that public health in these countries actually benefit from this? It's not really us to argue this point, but it's actually them to ponder because not everything in this world is going to stay, to stay this way forever. Look at the credit crisis now. Look at the oil companies. Iran thought they were going to be golden with all this money. Now they're crying because oil prices are going down. Medical tourism, you may be out-competed, so you may have to look at how you can build your infrastructure while you can. And your infrastructure includes your own medical, public medical system as well. And then, what does really this whole talk? What does it really tell us about our U.S. healthcare system? We are under, to be honest, we're being competed against. We are Ford, GM, Chrysler. I don't know. We're going to ignore the Toyotas of the world, the Nissans of the world. They did for a while. It cost them. It cost them dearly. And I, I, it wouldn't be that far fetched, in my opinion, that they get more than one percent eventually. Of our healthcare system, if we don't find a way to kind of streamline or fix our own, we gotta look internally to see what works and what wor what doesn't work, and why we have these cost issues, why we have these outcome issues. And like I said, we all know hospitals locally that we wouldn't touch, we wouldn't go in there. So our hospitals overseas that we wouldn't go in there. So it's, it's really not that much different in some respects. So that, 